Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Just so glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight, giving him praise and glory for all that he has done. Tonight, before we go on broadcast at 7 p.m., we're going to just open up with a few, song, few songs just to draw our minds in. And so that we can concentrate on the Lord and remember and reflect on what he has done for us and why we're here tonight. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, and what can make me whole again? Oh, it's nothing but the blood of Jesus singing oh precious is that flow oh that makes me white as snow no other no other found I know oh is nothing but the blood of G. What can wash away my sins? What can wash away my sins? Oh, it's nothing but the blood of G. What can make me whole again? Make me whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, singing, oh, precious is that flow that makes me. And no other felt I know. Oh, no, there's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Don't you know, I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. Yes, I know it was the blood for me. Oh, one day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross. And I know it was the blood saved me. Oh, yes, I know it was the blood. Yes, I know it was the blood. Yes, I know it was the blood. Save me. Oh, one day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross. Oh, I know it was the blood. Save me. Oh, the blood came, the blood came streaming down. Oh, the blood came streaming down. Oh, the blood came streaming down for me. One day when I, one day when I was lost, Jesus died on the cross. Oh, I know it was the blood saved me. I know it was, I know it was the blood. Do you know it? I know, I know it was the blood for me. Oh, one day when I, Jesus died, Jesus died on the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Come on, let's give the Lord a praise. Let's give him thanks. Let's give him honor. For today is the day that the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Today is the day that the Lord has made. And we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I want to welcome one and all to Transformation Church. Here at 5150 Baltimore National Pike. Here in Baltimore, Maryland. Our pastor is Bishop Monroe R. Saunders Jr. Let's give God praise for him. Hallelujah. We're thanking God for our lovely lady, Winsome Saunders, who is in the building with us tonight. We God bless you. Today is the seven last words of Jesus Christ, where we come to reflect on the scriptures and draw our minds in for what God has done for us one more time. We don't just do this out of habit or vain tradition, but this is very important to us. 
that we realize the work that God has done for us, the work of Calvary, how it has set us free. And while we're standing here today and can lift our hands and praise the Lord, say hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. As we go before the Lord in prayer today, Elder Gloria Davis is going to lead us in prayer and read our scripture. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we come now in the precious name of Jesus. First to say thank you. This is the day that you have made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you, Lord God, for your loving kindness, your tender mercy, and your grace. Thank you, Father God, that you have allowed us to gather ourselves tonight, that we may celebrate what you have done for us on the cross. Thank you, Lord God, for saving us from our sins, for translating us from out of a world of darkness into your marvelous light. Thank you, Father God, for staying fit to save us out of a wretched world as this. Lord God, we thank you for the finished work of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the burial, Lord God. We thank you for his crucifixion and the resurrection. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord God, for resurrecting us in a new life, Lord God. And that life is in Jesus Christ. Now have your way in this place. Be glorified as we magnify you. Be magnified in everything that is said and done. We thank you, Lord God. We praise you and we magnify you. We give you glory, honor, and praise for the finished work, for the complete work, for the salvation work, for the redemption work of Jesus Christ in our lives and for the world. Lord God, have your way and in everything we'll give you glory, honor, and praise. Now bless, we pray for the preachers of the hour. Anoint each one of them afresh and let them preach the adulterated God of Jesus Christ. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to a church. So we leave from this place knowing how to walk in an upright way and showing a world there's a reality of serving a living, true and living God. We thank you, we praise you, and we say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The scripture is from Matthew's the 26th chapter. We'll be reading from verses 6 to 13. That's Matthew's the 26th chapter. Verses number 6 through 13. And this is the word of God. Now when Jesus was in Bethany, in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and, the pure, and pour it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said to unto them, Thy trouble ye the woman, for she have wrought a good work unto me. For you have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she have poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verse 13, Verily I say unto you, Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the world, in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman have done, be told for a memorial for her. Let the people of God say amen. 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 Years I spent in vanity and pride carry not my lord was crucified 
knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary. Oh, mercy, there was great and grace was free. Oh, and pardon, and there was multiplied to me. Oh, and then my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. Oh, mercy, mercy, there was great and grace was free. Oh, pardon, there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul, there my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. One more time, mercy, there was great. Oh, mercy, there was great and grace was free. Oh, pardon there was multiplied to me oh and then my burdened soul found liberty at calvary come on let's thank him for calvary let's give god some praise let's give god some praise welcome him into this building we thank you lord hallelujah Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. We thank you. We give you praise. We just had to warm up a little bit because we're about to do an exercise in the word of God tonight. And we don't want anybody to be nervous or fatigued or feel that they can't do anything. So sometimes we got to sing ourselves happy. Hallelujah, because it's at Calvary. So we don't come to judge or to spectate. We're going to sit in prayer. We're going to sit in prayer. Because the word is going to minister to us tonight. Because that's why we come to hear from God. And our first speaker, our second and our third speaker, Elder Audrey Merritt will be Father, forgive them. Elder James Blackwell, you will be with me in paradise. And Minister Dwayne Saunders, woman, behold your son. Hallelujah. Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. This verse is found in Luke 23, 34. These are the first words Jesus uttered after he was hung in place on that cross. Isaiah 53 helps us to understand the gravity of this powerful statement. Beginning at verse 3 from the New Living Translation, he was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses that he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. The execution of the sentence of crucifixion was always preceded by a brutal beating called scourging and flogging. The Romans used a short leather whip of flagrum, which consisted of small pieces of bone and metal attached to a number of the leather strands. During this brutal beating, the victim was stripped naked and tied to a post exposing their back. This merciless act was carried out by not one, but several of the, of the guards. With each strike of the whip, 
the skin was ripped from the back repeatedly over and over and over again, exposing a bloody mass of tissue and bone, causing extreme blood loss. Pilate gave the order for Jesus to be flogged. In addition to this, Jesus was then subject to even more cruelty by the entire battalion of Roman soldiers, about two to 300 soldiers guarding him, each one hitting him, spitting on him, mocking him, and adding insult to injury. A crown of about 70 one and a half inch thorns was created that they pressed on his head, piercing the scalp. This abuse left Jesus badly bruised, swollen, extremely weakened, and in excruciating pain. Isaiah 53 continues, all of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's paths to follow our own, yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he said, never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep is silent before the shearers, he did not open his mouth. Unjustly condemned, he was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of my people. He had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal. He was put in a rich man's grave. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It is a prayer or a plea to the Father driven by love. Jesus' love for his Father and his love for all whom the Father would give to him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Came from a place of yielding. Jesus was in agony of spirit, knowing the suffering that was about to take place. After the Passover meal, he went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray, to plead, to beg the Father to remove this cup of suffering, this assignment from him. But thanks be to God, because of love, Jesus relinquished his will, saying, nevertheless, not my will but always yours be done. Yielding his will to God's will allowed Jesus to first be able to forgive the thems and the theys. He would then ask his father to forgive. It wasn't easy, but it was worth it because you were worth it. Bloody from head to toe, bruised and swollen from head to toe, in excruciating, mind-numbing pain from head to toe, hanging from a cross by nails in his wrists and his feet. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This profound statement at the height of his agony made it possible for us as believers to forgive. Forgiveness is an intentional decision to let go of resentment and anger. Are you holding on to unforgiveness? Unforgiveness is toxic to your spirit, soul, and body. It blocks the inner peace Jesus was punished for. It makes our faith ineffective and hinders our prayers. Mark eleven twenty six 26 clearly states, if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your transgressions against him and others. So like Jesus did in the garden, relinquish your will and yield to God's will. Release the hurt. Release the anger. Release the resentment. Release the heartache, the disappointment, the offense, and forgive them. Say with purpose and by faith, Father, I forgive them, for they know not what they do.
Hauptstadt der Hessischen Linken. Das war doch für das, was sie mit Rüstung. Nein. St. Luke, verse 39, 22nd, I'm sorry, 23rd chapter, 39th verse. And one of the malefactors, which was hanging, rattled on him, saying, If thou be the Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered and rebuked him, saying, Do thou not fear God? And see it, thou art of the same condemnation. We indeed are justly for the receiving due the reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when I come into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Paradise lost, paradise restored. In the book of Genesis, we see that God had created the Garden of Eden with the best male and female that had eternal life in them. They had the blessings of God upon their lives. They would have lived for eternity if they had not disobeyed God and listened to the enemy that was kicked out of heaven and lost his job and became a serpent and came down and deceived her and got kicked out of the garden and God put a fanning sword in between them that they could not go back into the eternal state. So this evening, the two malefactors, one that had a mindset that was rattling, his heart has been hardened of unbelief and didn't want to obey and believe that Jesus was the Christ. We see all the way down through the scriptures that Jesus of footprints of Christ coming 40 and two generations. That each step along the way as he stopped there, hallelujah, and saved Noah and the eight that found grace, but on each page of the scripture, Jesus was walking towards Calvary to save all mankind. So we come tonight to reflect on two malefactors, but one having the right good sense to realize that he was right there with the eternal God in his midst the Savior of the world, right there that could have delivered him and brought him into eternity, hallelujah, forever. But he chose to not obey, not to believe because of unbelief. He was lost. But the other, the second one, rebuked his companion in the death and warned him that he should fear God and get rid of his sarcastic mindset. He said, who would suffer the judgment and have no position to insult Jesus? We indeed justly are one criminal knowing that we deserve what we, for what we have done. Those 
Cristo. Because the wages of sin is death. We deserve death. But this man has done nothing wrong. This man is holy and righteous. He is the son of God. Hallelujah. And because of that, Jesus told him, Today thy shall be with me in paradise. This is a remarkable saying. For in his sight that here there are all these people that were there, the Pharisees, the scribes, and all were mocking the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Savior of the world, that he had the compassion even there while he was in such agony going through after the beating that he had taken. Hallelujah. That he still had compassion on the thief on the cross that said, Today, I shall be with me in paradise. So paradise was about to be restored. Hallelujah. That was lost. Hallelujah. In the garden. He was now paying the price and shedding his precious blood, taking the beating, being humiliated and torn apart. His body was broken to pieces there. Glory to God. Amen. So God, he said, this day, this day, thy shall be with me in paradise. There, there are times that some people get uh, uh, a dead uh, last minute on the deathbed uh, salvation. But that is not the requirement that Jesus had for us and the church. He, well, he desires that we would follow the Pentecostal apostolic way on the day of Pentecost. He desires that we would know and appreciate that the blood has the power to forgive sin. He, he wants you to know tonight, hallelujah, that the paradise was meant to be a garden, a park. It was used by the means for the Greeks, hallelujah, that meaning pero, hallelujah, paradosa, the, the righteous dead of Shiloh, hallelujah. But God wants to know the requirements for us. We must be born again. We must hate sin. We must put on holiness and righteousness because we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. We must be washed in the blood, thoroughly from our iniquities, cleansed from our sins, that can be blotted out, hallelujah, as David cried out to God, Created me a clean heart and renewing me a new spirit, a righteousness. So God is calling us tonight as he did 2,000, hallelujah, and 24 years ago. It's been 40, 42 and two generations coming to the cross. And now it's been 2,024 years that we're looking back at the cross. But the blood is available the Holy Ghost is available. The power of love is available. Restoration is available. No matter what the world is going on, our God is greater. Our God is mightier. So we're coming down to close it out here. Glory to God. Hallelujah. The scripture says there in 1 John 3rd chapter, Behold what manner of love tonight the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but when we shall see him, we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. He, he is the hope of our salvation. He is the new heaven and new earth. He is the resurrection God, hallelujah, that paid it all for us, that we can have eternal life and walk with him in glory. He said, I see coming down for glory a new heaven and a new earth, hallelujah, that righteousness wrapped up in it. So tonight, hallelujah, God is able. If you believe, if you believe, God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think by the powers that work it within you. God bless you. Hallelujah.
right, don't stop, don't stop. Continue to give God the praise. Continue to give God the praise. Don't do it because I told you. Do it because you know that he's worthy. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Coming out of John chapter 19, verse 26 through 27 says in the English Standard Version, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his home. These words are focused a little bit more on family and relationship. And we all know that to be known in Christ, there must be a relationship. And at this point, we want to take a brief look into the relationship between Jesus, Mary, and John. We, I would like for each of you just to take a moment to visualize this. Because it amazes me that even Jesus had the breath and energy in his body to utter one word, let alone two different sayings at this point. His vision must have been blurred. His hearing must have been experiencing tinnitus, or some will say tinnitus, right? Uh, gasping for each breath that he took, struggling to speak. His physical strength is depleted. And the pain that he suffered at the cross would have been enough to occupy his full consciousness. He could hear the discouraging words from the priest located in Matthew 27, 42. He saved others. He cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross, and we will believe in him. But even through all these things on Calvary, what was on his mind and heart at this moment? His mother. God, Jesus still cared for his mother. He had a very practical concern. He wanted to make sure that his mother was taken care of. These words, again, are focused on family and relationship. Mind you, he was human, and yet he was not consumed with his own trauma. Time was running out, and with the reserved energy he possessed in his physical body, he took one moment to make sure that Mary was good. He looked over and trusted John to take care of her. Behold your mother. And Jesus loved John. In fact, John was the only apostle present at the cross, while the other disciples were scattered. Located in John 16, 32, Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. The disciples scattered in fear, but John was among the people that were at the foot of the cross. And at that time, it is tradition that the responsibility is passed down to the next oldest sibling. However, the siblings were not very supportive of Jesus' ministry, right? It is noted that Joseph at this point might have passed and that Mary was a widow. So with all this said, it was right that Jesus went to tell John, his friend, in whom he trusted, behold your mother. Oh, how wonderful it is to be employed for Christ. And to be entrusted with any of his interests in the world. The responsibility is heavy, but it is not one that you, or in case, John shies away from. Within that hour, he took Mary with him to his home. The biological relationship with family might not have been solid for Jesus, but the spiritual relationship or connection with John was located and emphasized in Matthew 12, 50. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. This establishes the idea that those who follow Christ and do God's will are meant to be connected like family. And we understand that family can be a tricky thing. Amen? We all know that there's some times that friction can occur among members, right? So much to a point where all you want to worry about is just yourself. You have enough problems going on. There's a lot of things that take up real estate in my mind. Why do I have to worry about anything else? Because you feel that it may not be worth the burden to carry. But the power of the Lord strengthens each and every one of us to handle it because he paid it all. Can you believe that today? He paid it all. And let the example that Christ set for us on the cross that even during our most painful moments in life, we still make sure to, as it says in Exodus 20, 12, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. This may be hard and difficult for some to hear because you might feel that you are misunderstood in your family. And Jesus had his moments. We can find it in Mark, tw- in Mark 3, 21, that his family at one point went out to seize Jesus and said that he was out of his mind. 
And even though through the torture and humiliation, pain, suffering, and abuse, Jesus did not focus on himself. Maybe that's something that we can all take away from this. We need to take a step back and start showing some love and compassion. Amen? For others. Yes, we experience the stress, strain, and troubles of our own, but we must show love. So let me ask you this as I conclude. What am I holding on to too tightly? Am I able to let go of someone or something and trust him during that submission? We must remember that when we let go of things, we are releasing to the Father who sent his only son to save us. So let us at this time and at this moment as we reflect, let us release, show love and compassion and honor those that we love. Woman, behold your son. Behold your mother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. When nothing, when nothing else could help, love lifted me. The love of God. Hallelujah. The love of God. Hallelujah. We thank God for the word that has been brought forth so far. It's offering time now. Hallelujah. As the ushers are coming now to lift up our offering, we're asking you that if you would get something tangible in your hands or you can use push pay online. The ushers are coming around with envelopes. If you need an envelope, you can raise your hand. And we're going to continue to worship God in the spirit of giving and in song. So whenever the ushers are ready, we're going to ask you to come around to the table. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. Oh, you came, you came from heaven to earth to show the way from the to the cross. My debt to pay from the earth, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven, you came from to earth. To show the way from the cross, cross my debt to pay from the earth to the cross, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name, I lift your name on high. Oh, Lord, I lift your name, lift your name on high. Lord, I lift you up. Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh, you're worthy, you're worthy. Lord, I lift your name on high. Oh, Lord, Lord, I lift your name on high. And Lord, we thank you for these gifts that we receive. Let them be used to the upbuilding of your kingdom in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Word five, words four, five, six, and seven will be coming from Elder Robert Thompson, Eli Eli, Elder Vernetta Chapman, I Thirst, Minister Rudolph Williams, It Is Finished, and Elder Darnell Eady. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Praise the Lord, everybody. 
in Matthew 27, starting at verse 46, it says, In about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Going to Job 23, verse 3, 8 through 10. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat. Behold, I go forward, but he is not there, and backward, but I cannot perceive him. On the left hand, where he doeth work, but I cannot behold him. He hideth himself on the right hand, that I cannot see him. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he have tried me, I shall come forth as pure, refined, luminous gold. After the Last Supper, Jesus took his inner circle to the Garden of Gethsemane, and there he became weighted down with grief, so heavy that he told them, pray with me. And he went a stone's throw away, and he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. And he comes back to Peter. He says, you couldn't pray with me one hour? He said, to behold, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. This is the first and only time in scripture that you see Jesus at civil war, his flesh at war with the will of the Father. And he goes back and prays a third time saying the same words. And then in Luke, it says that an angel appeared and strengthened him. That word strengthen, the Greek there means to in spirit. He was inspirited by the angel. And we see this, which means to fill with strength of purpose. The first time we see this is in 1 Kings 19 with Elijah, where he had such a heavy journey ahead of him, the angel came and fed him. And after he fed him, the Bible says that he was able to go 40 days and nights with no food or water because of the strength of the journey. After Jesus was inspirited by the angel, here comes Judas, who betrays him with a kiss. And instead of Jesus cursing him like he did the fig tree, he calls him friend. He's then taken to Ananias' house. And there in the garden, Peter, the one who received the revelations as to who Jesus was, denied him. And all Jesus does is look at him and keeps quiet. Talk about strength. He's then taken from Ananias' house to Caiaphas' house where they lie on him and they denigrate him. And then they, okay, they convict him of heresy and of blasphemy. And they beat him, and they mock him, and they spit on him. And instead of calling 10,000 angels, he does nothing to defend himself. He's then taken from Caiaphas to Pilate. And there, Pilate would have let him go. But the same people who a week earlier said, Hosanna, which means, oh, save. They said, crucify him. Give us the thief. Give us the liar. Give us Barabbas. Crucify him. He's then taken and given to the Roman soldiers who beat him within an inch of his life. And he does nothing. He doesn't call for help. He does nothing. He's then led to Golgotha and he's nailed to the cross. And there he still has strength to stay on purpose. He still has strength to fulfill all the scriptures that was written about him. He still has the strength to carry on because remember in the garden he was inspirited. But about the ninth hour he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why hast thou left me destitute? Why hast thou left me in straits, left me helpless in this bad, difficult state of affairs? Like a drink offering to God's strength had been poured out. And he's left on the cross. And the Lord says, and, and, and it's recorded in Psalms 22, it says, he did not hide his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard him. He listened to his cry. What the Lord is telling, wants you to understand is that there are things that you are going to have to go through that are, to, are for the perfecting of your faith. I said, Lord, what are you talking about? He said, you don't need my strength to die. There are some things that you're going to have to die to. And I have four points. And I promise you I'm going to sit down. It is recorded that the Lord said, my word shall not return to me void. But it shall accomplish that which I sent it to do. 
Someone might be asking, well, what do I need to die? And I have four points for you. The first one thing is you need to die to yourself. You need to die to having things your way. It's his way, not our way. Thy will be done. Thy kingdom come. It's your way, Lord, not my way. Second, you need to die to fear. The trepidation that is keeping you from obeying God's word. Fourth, third thing is, you need to die to doubt. Doubting God's word, doubting his promise. He said, he that has begun a good work of you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. And the day of Jesus Christ is not when you die and when we go to heaven. It's when, that when Christ looks at you, he sees a reflection of himself. Pure gold is, you know, it's pure when a refiner can look at it and see his own face. Four, you need to die to people. Die to your need for their approval. Die to your need for if they never accept you, if they never like you, if they never called you out, if they never called your name, if, they, if you're never their favorite, you need to be like, for God I live and for God I die. I didn't, I'm not here for you. I'm here for the Lord. I'm going to end this with my father-in-law's favorite verse. The God of grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, he himself shall restore and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. The Lord has called you. He has perfected you. He is perfecting the things to, for, to, that is relating to you. And after you have suffered a while, he said, your, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. This is an opportunity for your faith to grow. When I was teaching my son to ride his bike, I would run beside him and hold the seat. But after a while, I had to let him go. The Lord said, in order for your faith to be perfected, he had to step back and let you operate in his word. And this is what, here's, the, here's my clothes right here. He's still with you. He still sees you. He still got a purpose for you. Be blessed. John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. My theme for my word is who is the model? Who is the model? I have a dear friend who always says when we discuss the behaviors of the church community at the large, if Jesus is the model, then who are we following? In preparing for this word, I thought about many different themes, but then I was reminded of the question, who are we modeling if Jesus is the model? So I pose this question to you this evening. As a member of the body of Christ, who are you modeling your life after? John 14 and 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus followed the path of his destiny, which was foretold hundreds of years before he was born. Isaiah 53 says, he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Every step of his life, he was destined for the cross. To redeem man back to God, blameless and sinless. He modeled a selfless life even on the cross. When we come to this fifth word, I thirst, we realize this is the only statement made by Jesus to satisfy his own personal need. Every other act he has shown were acts of love, compassion, and forgiveness for others. 
how many selfless acts would we have displayed at a time like this? In situations far less tragic or severe, we refuse to show forgiveness, love, or compassion toward others as Jesus has modeled. Yet we say we are followers. We don't want to get forgive someone for the smallest infraction. But Matthew 6.15 says, but if we forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Who are we modeling? We find that if we do not model after the example set by Jesus, we are prone to follow the world's principles of unforgiveness and hungering and thirsting for greed, lust, deceit, and pride. And it is man's hunger and thirsting for the things of the world that has Jesus in this horrible place of crucifixion. Why? Because the love of God has for his sinful creation, us, Jesus had to hang on the cross. Jesus also had to hunger and thirst for the sins of the world. It was not his nature to do so, but it was his assignment, his destiny. Such a paradox. Jesus is overwhelmed by a desire for one of the most natural needs of the body, to thirst. He could hardly speak. Psalm 21 and 15 says, my mouth is dried up like a parchment and the tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of death. The heat of the day and the long hours of torture has him hydrated and drained. But more than just his physical need of thirst, there is a spiritual need for his soul and his spirit. He had to hunger and thirst for the sin he took on but now he wants to disconnect from the sin and reconnect to the very essence of his spiritual DNA. But he whispers with every sound that he can muster up. For he knows what the word says. God will hear his faintest cry. Audibly, hardly audibly, he says. There is nothing man can do for him or to him now. This is the only one kind, there is only one kind of water that can revive him now. The living water. That will allow him to never be parched or dry again. The same water he told the woman at the well about, he now seeks that water. When we hunger and thirst for God's righteousness, there is nothing that can revive our sin-sick souls but the cleansing power of God. We used to sing a song right here in our sanctuary. I don't hear that song very often anymore, not here or anywhere. And that song simply says, He that hungers, hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled. When the world has whipped us, when we realize we need a savior, and the price has already been paid by the precious blood of Jesus, when we realize that there is only one who can fulfill the longing of a sin-sick soul, when we remember the model, we should follow then and only then will we begin to sing the song again. He that hungers, hungers and thirsts after righteousness shall be filled. Then and only then can we live the model that we are supposed to live for Jesus Christ. He that hungers, hungers and thirsts for righteousness shall be filled.
Praise the Lord again. My assignment is it's finished to lay hold. That is the Greek pronunciation for it. It's finished. As I read my text, I think I come to mind to think about how when Christ gave up the ghost and he said that it was finished and it's in John 19 and 30 and when he said that it's fin when he said that it's finished i can i can just perceive that he looked out on the crowd and he looked and he seen the condition of mankind and as he gave up that ghost, and as he laid his head, they brought to him, as his sister already stated that he thirsted, they brought to him the vinegar. But he did not even take the vinegar. But, but he gave up the ghost, and he said, it's finished. Hello. The veil had been rent from top to bottom. In Galatians 5 and, and, um, in 5 and 5, it says that, it's through the spirit that we wait for the hope of righteousness. And in Galatians 3 and 28, it says that in Christ there's neither male nor female, nor Jew, nor Greek, nor bond, nor servant. But we are all one in Christ. We are the seed of Abraham. Praise God. And as I thought about that, I said there, Lord, the veil has been rent. From top to bottom. We had we we had what you call wilderness ammunition. In him, we are literally one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We are the first responders to every situation because we are God's, we are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. In him, because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. The mercies of God, what a theme for my song. Oh, I never could number or they're more than the stars in the heavenly dun. Are the sands of the, the wave-beaten shore. For mercy so great, what return can I make? For mercy so constant and sure, I'll love him, I'll serve him with all that I have as long as my life shall endure. They greet me at a morn when I awaken from sleep and they gladden my heart at the noon. They follow me on, on into shades of the night when the day with his labor is done. His angels of mercy encompass me round wheresoever my pathway may lead. Each turn of the road some new token reveals. Oh, for me life is blessed indeed. Because he lives we can face tomorrow. Because he lives all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living be just because he lives. It's finished. Telejo. God bless you. Praise the Lord. There we go. Hallelujah. Can we give another hand for those that have gone already? Truly a beautiful, beautiful job. And I now have the task to close us out. And I'll be coming from Luke 23, verse 46. And I'll read that in your hearing. 
Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last breath. As it has already been established for us so, so, so very powerfully, we find Jesus now at the end of his life, and he has endured a great traumatic experience. It is at this point we recognize that Jesus has been betrayed. He's been left alone. He has been beaten within an inch of his life. At this point, we realize that Jesus has forgotten about his own experiences and thought more about the people that were surrounded there. Not only did he think about them, but he also thought about you. It is at this point that we realize that Jesus is in the last seconds of his life, and at this moment, he utters some words. I want I wonder if we could put our minds to something that we realize as a part of the human experience, that when you find yourself at the end of your life, you begin to think about the entirety of your life. Amen? Also, we know in the human experience that when we find ourselves at our very end, that it is at that time that we say some of the most powerful things. We're not wasting words because we know we have few words. We're not just talking jibber-jabber. We're not talking about foolish things. It's on our deathbed that we begin to set things right, that we begin to say things that have gone unsaid for years. Oh, you've been around the bedside where grandma let out some secrets that no one knew. She told you who people's father was and who their mothers really were. Oh, it's just my family. That's all right. That's all right. I don't mind standing up here telling the truth. I say all of this because it is important for us to now think about what Jesus is saying here in the last seconds of his life because it has to be important. It's important for us to understand where he derived these words from? Well, Jesus isn't just saying anything. He's actually quoting scripture. He is at this point quoting uh, Psalms 31 and 5 at this time. So that's important for us to realize for two reasons. One, Jesus is now quoting a text that he would have learned as a child. That's the first point. It is important for us to make sure that we are training up our children in the way that they should go at a young age so that when they find themselves being crucified by life, they have something to hold on to. It's a problem that we're willing to bring our children to the Easter egg hunt, but not to Sunday school. Let it sink in. Let it sink in. Let it sink in. Because Jesus on the cross didn't need an Easter egg hunt. He needed what he learned in Sunday school. Amen? Can we be real about this thing? Can we be real about it? Listen, I'm all for the Easter egg hunt, but bring us to Sunday school too. The second point that we derive from this is that the scriptures in holding them a power that we need to grab and gravitate to and not forget about. Bishop, we waste too much time talking about nonsense and talking about what we think. What does the scripture say about it? Jesus, at the end of his life, wasn't trying to come up with something new to say. He went back to what was tested and tried. He went back to the word of God and said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Well, let's take just a few moments to think about where these words come from and what David was experiencing when he wrote them. David had found him himself being chased by his own son. Can I stop here just for a moment to talk about the parallel that we see here? David wrote these words when his son was trying to kill him, and now Jesus is quoting them when his father is killing him. Think about that thing. Jesus, how masterful his mind had to be that he went through and picked up a scripture that spoke to the very situation that he was going through, saying, Father, why are you doing this to me? See, that's the subtext that's written between the words that he said. Father, why are you allowing this? I know that you can stop it right now. But even in his last breath, he says, your will be done, not mine. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I know that that you could end this situation at any time. But if it pleases you for me to die in this moment, then die I will. When David wrote these words, he found himself pushed up against the wall. He didn't know what he was going to do. He didn't know how he was going to deal with the challenges that were succumbing him. I wonder if there are a few people in here that can remember a time in their lives where they were up against a wall. I'm not talking to people who have been minorly inconvenienced in their life. This is not for those of you who pray when you got a flat tire. This is not for those of you who cried when you couldn't pay your bills, but the week before you were in Dubai. This is for the people that have been through some struggles. This is for the people that will raise their hands and say, 
I wasn't about to go crazy. There were a few years where I was certifiable. This is for the people that can be honest and say I was broken, but he reached down and picked me back up. To those people, I say this. You have a savior that at any moment you can cry out to and say, Father, I don't know how I'm going to deal with this. I don't know how I'm going to face this challenge, but all I know is that I have put my soul in your hands. And because I put my soul in your hands, this isn't my problem. This is yours. I encourage you to read Psalms 31. There are some powerful things found there. There's a point where David says to the almighty God, you are my rock. You are my salvation. And because of that, it's your problem to bring me out of this. David had enough knowledge about who he was to say, when I struggle, I don't struggle alone. I struggle with God because he's right down here in the muck with me. So I rose up just to share these very simple, simple words with each and every one of you. And it comes from Psalms 31, 24. David said after he lamented about all that he was going through, after he realized that his back was against the wall, he ended by saying this, so be strong and courageous, all you who have put your hope in the Lord. Has anybody put their hope in the Lord? If that's you, when it gets tough, be strong. When you don't know how you're going to make it through, be courageous when the enemy so bold as to come up into your house and think he can take your children think he can do whatever he wants be strong and be courageous because you have given your souls unto the Lord and so there's nothing the enemy can do with you I end saying be 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 strong 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 I'm so sick of weak Christians be strong and courageous because you have trusted in the Lord stand on what you know to be true. Give God praise. Give God praise. Give God praise. Look to a neighbor, say, neighbor, be strong. Be strong, be strong, be strong. The Lord who's with you will never forsake you. Hallelujah. Oh, we just think about it. We talk about who we model ourselves after. You need to model yourself after Jesus, who is the author, who is the finisher of the faith. And no matter what it is we're going through, we have a sample, an example. We have one who we can look to, who in spite of everything he went through, still at the end, like it's stated in one of the writers in the New Testament, and having done all to stand, keep on standing. No matter what may be going on, it is the Lord who is the strength and the power of our lives. Would you put your hands together, please? And be not hearers only. If it were just hearing without absorbing, without allowing the word to be nourished within our spirit and body, our whole being. We would not be able to make it. But it's because of the grace of God that what I hear, and you gotta hear, that's why I, you know, when the psalmist comes, he gets these words, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
It's a matter of getting so hungry for the word that you can taste it. Not only do you taste it, but you consume it. And you ingest it. And you allow it to flow and to feed every fiber of your being. I'm so glad today for this week. And thank God for the week of fasting. I thank God for the prayers that have been offered in the 6 o'clock hours on in the morning and for that which is yet to come and then we come back here on Saturday and at 8 o'clock we just come and still continue to lift the power and the grace of God and give him all the glory and just to thank him and Lord I, I'm excited we come back here Friday I forgot we come back here Friday oh Lord knows yes we got to come back here Friday <laughs> And participate, partake of the Lord's Supper. It is that, again, that reminds us of the great work that we have to do. We don't know what the next moment will bring. All we know is that every moment we need to make certain that we are connected with the one who can keep us. I, like many of you, on the other day, and I, I got... A message early, uh, at least sometimes before 4 o'clock, around 4 o'clock on that morning of prayer because the bridge had collapsed. So I had, uh, I didn't know what was going on. And I, I looked, turned, and I saw what was going on, and I got my wife and told her, I said, look, look, look what's happened here. And understand the lives that are lost we don't know from one moment to the next a bridge doesn't have to collapse all it takes is one crazy driver or two speeding around the beltway who wipes out six who are working on the highway we never know but this one thing I know, that every day we need to make certain that we are connected to the God who is our keeper and sustainer. And if we keep connected, no matter what will happen, no matter when it may happen, everything will be all right. That's why we reach out. That's why we talk about. That's why we preach this gospel. So that someone can understand that life consists of more than just breathing air in and air out. We are spirit. Looking, discovering all that it is that God has called and placed us in this earth to be. And I don't know if you're here tonight. Everybody in here, I guess, mostly know the Lord. Have gotten to touch him, but... This week is not just about a celebration. It's about an invitation to receive that for which Jesus gave his life for. He died for each of us in order that we might live. And as it says in Corinthians, so you know that you don't live unto yourself, but you live for him. Who gave his life for you. There's anyone here tonight who has not given their life to the Lord Jesus. I open up the invitation to you right now. You can say that he's sweet, I know. Personal testimony. He, he's sweet, I know. Oh. You know that storm cloud, they may rise and strong winds, they may blow, but I know that I. I found him. 
I found it. You found me. That I found a Savior. And he, sweet, I know. If you found him, just join me and sing it. Your testimony. speakers to come down and if your spouses are here with you I just want them to come and stand with you we understand to be in a place where we minister the word and the gospel of Jesus Christ is full of challenges uh, we become targets of the enemy he will attack us wherever he can but I thank God for these And if you don't have a spouse standing with you, I pray the angel right next to you. <laughs> we praise the name of the Lord. Thank you, uh, Elder Ambush, for leading us tonight. Thank you, Elder Charles. <laughs> 